What is up, everybody? I am Kevin Ioli. Thank you for joining me. What a pleasure for me right now to interview this guy. To me, the greatest broadcaster in MMA history just does an unbelievable job calling the play-by-play -play for the UFC fights. John Anik is joining me. John, thank you for taking the time and uh, and uh, joining me for this. My man, if people only knew what it meant for me to hear Kevin Ioli say that, the guy who was on my mouthpiece boxing radio show 20 years ago. Uh, but thank you, brother. It's great to be here and uh, great to be in this new space, obviously, with you on your new site. So here we go. Thank you. Incredible. You know, and I wanted to just talk to you. The reason I asked you to come on uh, UFC 300 next week, uh, you were going to be calling those fights. And, hey, you know, it's got a long way to go to surpass UFC 299 <laughs> because we have that in the books now. And that was a phenomenal card. I think on paper, uh, Dana White has said he believes this is the greatest card that he has ever put together. Uh, let me throw that at you. You know, do you buy that? I mean, on paper, do you feel UFC 300, the 13 fights that we're going to see uh, on April 13th are the best uh, 13 that the UFC has ever put out? Unequivocally, yes. And if that sounds promotionally hyperbolic, so be it. Now, I have thought about this more in the context of when I signed with the company in 2011, of all the fights that I have been assigned, the fight cards, I guess I should say, this is assuredly the deepest fight card and the best fight card I have ever been assigned. Followed yeah. closely by UFC 299. And you know as well as I do, there's really not much recency bias in there. I can't speak to exactly why they loaded up these two pay-per-views back-to-back. Certainly Miami is an initiative. Sugar Sean O'Malley is an initiative. And building around him, I think, was an initiative. But, Kev, this is an embarrassment of riches, right? Even coming from a guy who gets his check cut by the promotion, right? I mean, to me, the fact that you have all this star power on, on the front end of the featured prelim, the fact that Davis and Figueredo, future Hall of Famer, one of the most offensively pleasing fighters in UFC history, is going to hit the tunnel at like 3.30 in the afternoon. You know what I'm wondering? So Las Vegas cards, the atmosphere is incredible for the main card. But sometimes Las Vegas cards for the early prelim bouts is not that good. Now, knowing what we know about UFC 300, I wonder if we're going to see the stands full for that first spot like you do in sites that don't have UFC events all the time. I remember when Jim Miller in 2019, I think he fought Jason or Eric Gonzalez, whomever it was. He brought all four of his children there to see the fight in New Jersey and nobody was there. And Jimmy was fighting early and Jimmy's fighting early here again. I feel like it's going to be an early arriving crowd for Las Vegas. I would defer to the expert opinion in the room, which is yours. But I, I have a feeling it's going to be pretty effing loud when uh, when Figueredo and Cody Garbrandt hit that tunnel. No? I, I think so, too. And I, I don't know that it's going to be full, but I think we will see a, a, a much more representative uh, crowd than we do at a lot of early Las Vegas crowds. You know, like Jim Miller, like Buffer said, now he is going to consider doing Jim effing Miller in the introduction. Before he, he had said, no, Jim Miller wants to be introduced that way. Um, Bruce said, no, he wasn't going to do it. But I think now he's having second thoughts. So we may see that. I think people are going to show up to, to watch that. Hey, I got breaking news. I got breaking news on that front. I mean, I might as well do it here because we all love you and your site. So, uh, I mean, it stands to reason that at the morning weigh-in, Kev, right, when I'm off camera and I'm saying 155 pounds or 156 pounds for Jim Miller, I could do it and not get in trouble. But Bruce Buffer and I got a text message from our producer, Zach Candido, yesterday. Uh -oh. And that said, uh, we're going to be on ESPN uh, for Jim Miller. So no chance. So there you have it from uh, Zach Cand Candido and the UFC brass. So it's not going to happen on ESPN, which doesn't surprise you, uh, right. but there will be opportunities to introduce him as Jim fucking Miller. And we'll see if I take advantage of those opportunities. Right? Okay. Well, we know you can get that, get that role. And that'll be incredible. So first of all, you know, I wanted to get your thought on the top fights. Like I did a poll on my site, Kevin Ioli.com. And I asked the fans the other day, uh, rank all 13 fights in the order you're most interested in until uh, the one that you're least interested in seeing. And so I want to break these down and maybe in a couple of groups. So right now, the top four, there's over 10,000 votes, John. Right now, the top four, number one is Gaethje Holloway. And I think that's going to be secretary in the Belmont. That's going to go and, and run away with it. Number two and three, I think there's going to, you know, we could see some switch there. Uh, Alex Pajeda versus Jamal Hill, the main event, uh, light heavyweight title fight, which I think is going to be phenomenal. And then Charles Oliveira versus Armin Sarukian. And that surprised me a little bit. I like that fight, but I was surprised that the public went that way. So, And then the fourth one being Yuri Prohaska and Alexander Rakic. Um, wow. Which, 
what is your uh, take on that uh, on the top four that the, the fans so far have kind of uh, uh, pointed out? Love the poll. Not surprised that we have deep five figures worth of votes already. I'd be lying if I said I had a different top three. I mean, certainly I could make an argument for Calvin Cater and Aljamain Sterling and just the novelty of seeing Kayla Harrison make that walk for the first time. I said in the context of this question that for me it was Armand Sarugan and Charles Oliveira. But in the context of which fight do I absolutely have to watch live, can't watch the next morning, can't watch tape delayed, have to buy the pay-per-view for... For me, it's probably the main event, and I think your poll just speaks to the quality of the main event because Jamal Hill's going to go for it. Yeah, Jamal Hill's going to go for it, whether it's on one Achilles or two. He's going to try to knock Alex Pereira out, and Alex Pereira might be the biggest superstar actively in the sport right now with respect to Conor McGregor and everybody else. So I don't think Jamal Hill's going to have the crowd. I don't think people quite understand the magnitude of the star power of Poetan right now. Uh, but you can be sure in the fighter meeting, Kev, my first question for Jamal is going to be about that, that wheel. And uh, we'll see how it holds up April 13th. But, yeah, I mean, that would probably be the fight for me that I absolutely need to see live. But most compelling, Charles Oliveira and Armand Sarukia. I spoke to uh, uh, Sweet Dreams, uh, Jamal Hill, today, earlier today. And this is the second time I've talked to him in the last couple of weeks. And he is very confident in that in that Achilles. And he, uh, Dr. Neil Elitrach, who has done a lot of surgeries on, on famous athletes, you know, usually doing shoulders. He, he reattached the uh, Achilles in uh, – and, and Sweet Dream said no issues with that, and he feels like he is going to be at his best uh, for the fight, and that he doesn't, you know, he doesn't have any excuses. He's going to be on top of his game. So, you know, that's always good. You want to see the two best guys, and I think that's what we have here: the two best guys in that division going at it at a hundred percent and deciding who who the goat is. I couldn't agree with you more. I think Jamal Hill, <clears throat> certainly on the merits of what he did against Glover Teixeira and the manner in which he was forced to vacate the throne, deserves this championship opportunity. And we'll see what he can do with it. And it's not to suggest that he doesn't have that 25-minute dog within if he has to dig deep and maybe fight through some scar tissue and some pain on that Achilles. And I do think the matchup is such that, uh, you know, even if he was 100% in an active competition cycle, he might really just go for it early against Alex Pineda that a lot of us think he might be doing stylistically right now anyway. So it's a fascinating main event. You know, I'm glad that these guys are getting the opportunity to headline and, uh, Imagine if Jamal Hill does it, right? And I think the betting line speaks to how close the fight is, right? So many people wondering aloud, how's Jamal Hill going to do this, right? Even me, right? Nine, ten months removed. Well, it's a plus 110 underdog, Kev. It's not like he's plus 200. Yeah, I, I'll tell you what. I, I, I think he has a shot to win this. And, and Pahade is a guy that, like, look at who he's fought. I, I did an interview with Max Holloway the other day, and I was praising him for his body of work over his career. Like, there's nobody that has done over a long period of time. You know, 2012 he fought, or 2013 he fought Conor McGregor, 2012 Poirier. I mean, and, and now he's got Justin Gaethje uh, in the BMF title fight. It's incredible what he's done over a long period of time. But I think in a compressed period of time, even considering those early fights in the Zufa era where, you know, the same guys were fighting all the time, right, because they didn't have the depth uh, on the roster, I think what Pajeda has done, you know, two Israel Adesanya fights, Jan Blahovich fight, um, uh, Yuri Prohaska. I mean, it's been incredible what he has done back to back to back to back. I mean, that to me is unprecedented in UFC history. I don't know if you would agree with that or not. Randy and Chuck fought a lot of those kind of fights too, but um, but what what uh, Poetan's doing here is amazing. There have been a handful of guys, Conor McGregor, Israel Adesanya, who have become Hall of Famers very quickly, right? Winning belts, multiple titles, defending them multiple times. And it's amazing to think that at at nine and two as an MMA pro, Alex Pereira is already what you and I would call the baseball fans and us, a first ballot UFC Hall of Famer. And I think it speaks to a lot of things. I think it speaks to financial urgency, right? He's got a couple sons and even dating to his UFC debut, talking about supporting those kids and understanding the financial gain to be had if he could take his kickboxing skills and apply them at a high level in mixed martial arts. And he has effectively done that. You know, I think his active competition schedule speaks to the fact that he is is prize fighting and trying to be active and make money in his fighting prime. He's 36 years old, but I just absolutely love the work ethic. And that is at the core of this success, right? Hardest worker in the room doesn't even begin to describe it. Appetite for MMA knowledge and appetite for grap grappling and wrestling. There are a lot of these athletes that realize great success in MMA and they never acquire 
an appetite for the wrestling and the grappling maintenance. And those are rare cases. Seemingly, this kid is all in. I call him a kid because I'm coming up on 50. But he's all in all the time. And, you know, if you're a father like me who preaches hard work, Alex Pineda is a great example. And, and that young kid is John Anik, the UFC play-by-play guy. When you're 64, you can call a 50-year-old a kid. So uh, we're going to call you a kid here. Um, you know, the one thing I think about Pajeda that's interesting, I think both of the guys in this fight have superstar potential, right, um, and crossover potential. I think he'll beat Pajeda, boom, you know, he's out there because he's got that personality. and he, He's got that smile and that whole – and he's a killer in the ring. But Pajeda has something he can do to me, John, that I think – may never be surpassed. He could go out there and be a three division champion. He's, he's six foot four. He's got a huge long wingspan. And if you said, Hey, Alex Pajeda is going to come into his next fight at 235, 240 pounds. I don't think anybody would blink. Right. I mean, that, you know, that would be a, a good weight for him. And at that size, I mean, with his punching power and everything else that you just described, that guy could be a three division champion. And how bizarre or how amazing would that be? in this era of competitive heavyweights and competitive MMA for him to be able to go across three divisions. If he yeah, he that. could go down as the greatest of all time. Not to suggest that he couldn't realize that distinction if he sticks around for a while, but I think time is working against him because even right. though maybe he made his pro debut back in 2015, there were huge gaps of inactivity, at least when it came to uh, his MMA career. But it's absolutely incredible what Alex Pereira has accomplished. And you're right. I mean, I didn't quite realize the magnitude of Poetan star power until I showed up at some of these live events. As far as the heavyweight division, you know, I actually think if there were an opportunity to not end that Adesanya series off a loss, he would willingly go back to down to 85 right. just because he has the work ethic to do so, right? Yeah, I think he could realize some success as a heavyweight. I don't know exactly what his goals are, Kev. I mean, I think a lot of them are financial, right? And certainly the baddest man on the planet, an undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. But I do think he gives up a lot of size and uh, a lot of things variably that I don't love against somebody like Tommy Aspinall, who I think has to be the standard right now, just given the fact that he's competing, you know, more than my man, Johnny Bones Jones. So I'd like to see it. Uh, but I just don't know that Alex Pereira's goals are so much rooted in uh, in that as opposed to getting uh, the biggest, fattest possible purse possible. But we'll see. He could do it. But I think that's, you know, if he is a two-time champion, and let's say it's Jones, right? Let's play this scenario out. Steve, Jones fights Stipe. Pereira win, beats Jamal Hill. Now they're looking for an end-of-the-year fight or maybe early, early next year fight. Him going up for John Jones' last fight to win his third weight class championship in the UFC, um, and John Jones, under that circumstance, John would have never uh, been beaten by another fighter in the UFC. So would John Jones go out in his last fight, uh, you know, against Alex Pajeda and, and and lose? That would, I mean, to me, that would be a massive pay per view. And that would then set this, this kid uh, forward in history where, you know, he, he might end his career as considered the greatest of all time. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a little bit idealistic, if I'm being honest. And I think it's ambitious to think that John Jones is going to all of a sudden fight twice here in a short amount of time. I mean, UFC 285 now was a long time ago, and I'm not sure yeah. that uh, that he is in training camp, right? So I think it's ambitious to think that that would happen. I do think that maybe the Alex Pineda matchup uh, and what he would be pursuing might be of more intrigue to John Jones than maybe a fight against Tom Aspinall to close out the year. But who knows? I mean, if John is able to get through the training camp and beat Stipe Miocic, he might want to turn it around quickly and, to your point, go out on that proverbial high note. So we'll see what happens. But it is Alex Pineda's world right now, and we're just living in it. And I, I assure you that's the case. Like, he really does control a lot of cards right now. And honestly, Kev, I wouldn't be surprised if he wins this fight quickly, and that is not my expectation for the record, uh, to see him try to wiggle his way onto Rio against Magomed Ankalaev. Well, that would, would that be something? Wow. That would be something. Let's, I know uh, I'm taking up a lot of your time. Yes, yes, yes. I'm taking up a lot of your time, so I want to kind of get through this. I want to get your take on, on, on two fighters in particular. Holly Holm versus Kayla Harrison. I, I'm, Kayla Harrison fight is really interesting to me because this woman fought 170 in judo uh, in the Olympics, right? She is a big woman cutting to 135. I think she deserves to be the favorite over Holly at this point, given Holly's track record. But you go, what do we do with Holly or Kayla Harrison? 
first time we're going to see her fighting at 135. She says she's had test cuts, but and I trust that team that she has, but my Lord, that's a lot of weight for her. Well, odds makers, they don't like high numbers in age, right? So Holly Holm over 40, and they love low numbers in that loss column, zero or one in the case of Kayla Harrison, who lost to Larissa Pacheco, right? So I think that plays into the betting line. I was kind of floored, Kev, just given the fact that we haven't had the fight before the fight, which is Kayla Harrison on the scale on Friday, that this price was so swollen. Can we please put some respect on Holly Holmes' name? I mean, I could sit here and give you buckets on Kayla Harrison, but my notes right here, and I'm cheating my notes right now, suggest that this is her Bantamweight debut, right? And she yes. fought at a catch weight of 150 pounds, her last fight last November. Last featherweight fight was November of 2020. So far be it from me to question her ability to not only make that weight healthily and fight at that weight or a little bit above that weight the following night. Uh but if you're asking me about that betting number, it's got to be factored in. And uh, when I see minus 600 or so next to Kayla, I don't believe it puts enough respect on Holly Holmes skills at whatever age, because Holly can fight her style till she's 47. That is a pass fight for me because I, I just can't play that given, you know, I would play uh, and lay the number for Kayla if I knew she was a 135 or I just don't know that. So that is a, I think that's a pass. We'll just watch that, enjoy that. And no, and no, uh, no ticket on that one. And uh, since I, I, I've t kept you, this will be my last question for you. Calvin Cater and Aljamain Sterling. I'm, I'm really interested in Aljo. You know, we talked for many years about how big Aljo, the former Bantamweight champion was when he fought at 135. Now he's at 145, and I said to somebody the other day, I think that Aljo is going to physically in the ring, might be the bigger guy. And Calvin Cater is huge, right? Calvin's a big uh, 45er, and Aljo just might be bigger. What do you make of Aljo uh, moving up to Bantamweight? And do you think, or excuse me, Featherweight? And do you see him as a legitimate contender in that weight class right off the hop? I do, and thank God he's not staring death in the face, cutting down to 135 pounds anymore. I mean, we had some pretty forgettable fighter meetings. Not that he didn't give us something with which to work, but you're just staring across at a man who is, you know, gosh, I mean, on the brink of death. I hate to sound so dire, Kev, but that's like what it is. So I can't wait to see him compete at 145 pounds. You're absolutely right. He's strong as an ox. You know, when he lifts weight, in a short amount of time, you know, he puts on muscle mass and I think in the right ways, I would suggest to you that his second featherweight appearance could be fantastic. I just think this first one could present some challenges just in terms of maximizing the weight, you know, making sure you are cutting some weight, but not cutting too much. And just this opponent in Calvin Cater is one of the better strikers in this division and just an absolute gamer in his own right. And it is his more natural weight class. But I do think it stands to reason that uh, reason that Aljo's the bigger guy and competes even better once he has this first featherweight fight in the UFC under his belt. The one thing I think Calvin's got uh, going for him is that length that he has, right? Although, you know, he um, Aljo fought Sean O'Malley, who who has some some good length, you know, maybe not the way that, that uh, Calvin Cater has. But do you think that that would be enough, you know, having been in there for the period of time he was, which wasn't very long against Sugar Sean, the fact that he was in there and saw that range and felt what it would take for him to get inside and, and to do his thing, do you think that will help him going into a fight against somebody like Cater, who's not the same fighter as Sugar Sean, but he has that those same kind of dimensions? Absolutely. And I just think the loss in general, Kev, is useful. You know, even hearing guys like Tim Welch, Sean O'Malley's coach, sort of talk about some of the patterns they saw with Aljamain Sterling that maybe they were able to take advantage of. So I just think there's a lot to be gained when you lose a high level, high magnitude fight like that for Aljo. But you're right that Cater is a different opponent, not necessarily the sniper, but gosh, man, just there's definitely a thud when it comes to Cal Calvin Cater hitting you and uh, just fan fantastic fundamentally. So it's a great fight. Like it really jumps off the card for me. It's it's comedy to me that a fight of that magnitude is happening at like 530 in the afternoon. I mean, the whole show is crazy like that. You know, it was funny. Uh, I'll just finish with this. I told Dana when we were talking about how many champions were going to be on the card. I said, you know, Don King used to do this with boxing cards. And Dana scoffed at me and said, oh, no, he did not. I said, I'm telling you, Don King had so many fighters under contract that he would have Ricardo Lopez, one of the great fighters in the history of boxing, fighting at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And so I went through some of the King cards in the 90s, and I think it was the second or third card I looked at. They had 11 current or former champions on that card. Wow. And so, so that only Don King has been able to match with uh, Dana White and the UFC are going to do at UFC 300 uh, on April 13th. Pretty incredible.
And these are fight circumstances. I can't speak to back in the day, right? But for Davis and Figueredo, that has who has essentially done nothing but main event, right? Yep. To be fighting a three-round fight in this type of setting, we can talk about the UFC Apex as a different competitive setting, right? If you have a bad warm-up, there's not a crowd to sort of bring you out of that particularly bad warm-up. But, uh, yeah, it's going to be an exciting night, man. Hopefully the fans are at KevinIoli.com and those – you know, ticket holders are going to show up early and be in the building for us. We will see that. Now, go before we go. Let's uh, talk. What's the broadcast crew for three hundred? Uh, you, Joe, in uh, DC? Is that the? Is that that the- is correct. We are in the United States of America, which usually means Joe will be there, and DC is alongside as well. All right, sounds good. John Anik, always a pleasure to talk to you. One of the best to ever do it. Always a thrill for me. Love listening to you. Thank you for joining me, John. You're the best, brother. See you soon. Thanks.